Thank you very much. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. It's going to be a trick for me to run this in my computer so I don't have to look back. It's fine. No, I think it'll be all right. I think if I can uh, coordinate my efforts here. We'll see. So um, I'm going to talk today about the medical effects of uh, radiation. And uh, basically, I feel that nuclear power and indeed the nuclear industrial complex, which includes nuclear weapons as well as nuclear power, uh, is severely hampered by what I call the three poisonous P's uh, of nuclear power, or of, of nuclear, and those are pollution, price, and proliferation. And we're again seeing the example of the, um, the uh, pollution today uh, in Fukushima. We know about price, and uh, the ambassador spoke about the cost of, to the Ukraine, which continues on, and Belarus as well. And proliferation is the other issue that we have to keep in mind, the connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. The, I first want to talk about the, the biological effects of radiation. And I want to say right out that there is no safe dose of radiation. You hear this all the time. Harmless to human health, safe dose. These, these are not, no effect on humans. It's pretty arrogant to think that it's just us. What about the plants? What about the fish? What about the insects that are affected by this? Well, we know, we know from the biological effects of ionizing radiation report, Beer 7, and the EPA, uh, that even low doses of radiation cause cancer. It's a direct linear relationship from low to higher. The more radiation you get, uh, the higher your chances of getting cancer. And it's cumulative, so that every x-ray you get, every CAT scan you get, uh, and that effect accumulates. Just like if you were taking small doses of arsenic every day, which you certainly wouldn't do. So why would we want to increase the amount of radiation that we get every day? Now we get radiation from basically three sources. One is background radiation. And we evolved with this, with background radiation. And you hear this, radiation's all around us. It's in the water, it's in the rocks. And indeed it is, and that's why in Wisconsin where we have high radon levels in people's basements, we make them put ventilation system in it because we know that that increase in background radiation causes an increase in lung cancer. So again, there is no safe dose of radiation. There is no free lunch here. It's just what we consider acceptable. Um, cancer and the effects of radiation, one single dose of radiation is sufficient to increase cancer incident years later. For example, uh, a 70 year old man getting a CAT scan, which may give him 20 millisieverts of radiation, <coughs> has maybe a 1 in 100,000 chance of getting uh, cancer from that. But a baby getting that CAT scan has maybe a 1 in 200 chance of getting radiation because you got a lot longer uh, for that to accumulate and live. And these cancers are indistinguishable from other cancers that might occur. Most cancers are increased after doses of radiation, and again, the effects are cumulative. One individual in a thousand will develop cancer from a 10 millisievert exposure, which is a, a CAT scan. Although in studies, it's been shown that even in a single hospital, the CAT scan amount of radiation can vary up to 13 times for the same procedure. So there really isn't a lot of standardization in medical radiation. And we get radiation from background radiation, from medical radiation, which may be necessary and may be helpful for us. Uh, and then the third source is the unwelcome radiation that we get from the nuclear industrial complex. And that's what we're thinking about today. Well, we know that low-dose radiation is not good for us. When I started practice, uh, more years ago than I care to remember. It was quite common as I did OB to do x-ray pelvimetry on pregnant women. And that was when we come in at labor and we do x-rays on the, on the on baby and measure the head with the pelvis to see if she could deliver the baby. Absolutely worthless procedure. And yet we irradiated many babies with this. And Dr. Alice Stewart showed through elegant studies that one x-ray of the fetus in utero, and the younger the fetus is, the more the effect, causes an increased incidence in leukemia in that child. And this has been corroborated by other uh, studies since. Recent study in the Journal of Medi American Medical Association showing that dental x-rays early in pregnancy, where the woman is wearing a lash shield but not a thyroid shield, 
cause low birth weight infants. So I wonder how many low birth weight infants were, were born in the Ukraine and Belarus as a result of the radiation that women received at that time. Just a dental x-ray, and they, we think it's probably because of the radiation to the thyroid gland that alters the metabolism that then affects the fetus. Well, how else does it affect the fetus? Uh, lowered IQ, and certainly those studies have been done in Sweden uh, from the effects of uh, the Chernobyl radiation showing that babies that were in utero at that time have lower IQ levels. So again, I think it's very important for us to dispel this myth that there is a safe dose of radiation and that low dose radiation is good for you, uh, good for your children, etc. But we're not worried so much about x-rays here. We're looking at a longer term picture. Most of our data about radiation comes from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that was a one-time dose of radiation. It was a, like a big x-ray, x-ray and gamma rays that the population got. Here, we're getting a continual dosage. People who continue to ingest this because of the, uh, the, the iodine, strontium-90, cesium, and even plutonium that came out of Chernobyl and is also coming out of the Japanese plant. And we really don't know what the long-term effects of that are. We're looking at an experiment that we're going to have to watch populations and the environment for hundreds of years to know what the effects are. This is a very, very cruel experiment. Because it enters the food chain, and the food chain starts with the deposition of the radiation and works its way up through grass that the cows eat, concentrated in the milk, and the children uh, drink the milk. Uh, and in the meat then, uh, chickens, cows that are fed these grains that we'll show some pictures of in a few minutes. And we're at the top of the food chain. And so again, we don't know the long-term effects of this. And this leakage occurs throughout the fuel cycle, from the time we mine the uranium at one end, uh, through the enriching process to the conversion to fuel, and there should be another arrow here, which is a diversion to nuclear weapons, because that's another big source of the radiation that we all have gotten. Uh, all the way to the reprocessing, as we, we know that the Fukushima plant has some reprocessed plutonium uh, being used in it, to waste storage, and we have no idea what to do with the waste storage. We don't have a clue. And this is mine tailings, and these tailings continue to emit radon and other products for thousands of years into the environment where people breed them. The animals burrow into this and get irradiated. Uh, and again, this is occurring all over the world. It's part of the leakage of radiation out of the nuclear industrial complex. Well, we know about radiation from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 100,000 people died immediately from thermal effects, uh, and then another 100,000 plus have died of radiation injuries. We're seeing new cancers, now increased incidence of strokes and heart disease. And of course, that doesn't say anything about the psychological effect, which is once again being visited on the Japanese population now uh, in many, many ways. We then continue to do nuclear testing with uh, over a thousand nuclear tests set off in the atmosphere. And uh, PSR and other organizations back in the early uh, 60s found strontium-90 in children's teeth, and that led to the Gulf Gown Test Ban Treaty. That radiation still lives in the ground and in the atmosphere today. It's blown up when dust is blown up. There's plutonium, strontium-90 measured around the world for nuclear testing. Uh, and again, uh, this uh, continues today as long as we don't sign a comprehensive test ban treaty. Well, Rondelap, that last explosion, blew a lot of coral up in the fallout, and that's the difference again between uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it floated over the island of Rondelap, and these children were playing out in the rain or the snow that was coming down. They thought it was snow, and it was pulverized coral that was radioactive. And this young man who had his uh, thyroid checked at Bethesda and then subsequently died of leukemia. Uh, and there were a number of deaths, including Japanese deaths in the Lucky Dragon uh, from the fallout from that particular explosion. And again, this effect goes on and on. This is you know, what we can look at in terms of the environment. We know what happens to the environment. Look at the Bikini Atoll. And this is a pumpkin that was grown in the Bikini Atoll after remediation effects have been done. They scraped off 17 inches of soil, they added potassium and probably some of the, uh, what's the zeolite, is that what they're putting on 
zeolite, it's a, a, a rock product, uh, on the soil to bind a cesium. And this is a pumpkin that was grown in 1985, 30 years after that explosion that we just saw in the Bikini Atoll. You can see this guy's wearing a lead-lined glove because there's so much cesium in that pumpkin. And the spike on the spectrophotometer is the cesium spike. And you can see what it did uh, to the pumpkin 30 years later. Well, we also have the example of Kishtam. Uh, my colleague is very familiar with that. Uh, where in uh, 1957, uh, one of these tanks like this, these happen to be in Hanford, with high-level waste blew up uh, because hydrogen built up, much like happened in uh, Fukushima. It contaminated a huge area of land, some uh, 350 miles downwind and 800 square kilometers, I think, is the, uh, and the people still can't go in. There are signs everywhere that say, don't come into this area. And yet the animals don't know that. They don't read the signs. They go in, they get contaminated. And as you're driving along the road, as I was in Kishtam a few years ago, you see these signs that say, don't come into this forest. It's too radioactive here. And this looks like my home in Wisconsin, frankly. And then we're driving along, and there's a field, and they're growing crops here. And I said, how can they grow crops here when this is contaminated in the forest right next door? Don't these crops get contaminated? Oh yeah, of course they do. So we have to eat. So we take crops from this area and we ship them to areas where there's no radiation and we mix the crops together. And that of course has happened in the Ukraine as well as I understand, I've read that. Um, and so, you know, dilution is the answer to pollution. When do we reach the level where that's not acceptable? And do you want your animals, your children eating crops that are grown in this area even if it is diluted down? Again, it accumulates. This is the cesium deposition in the Ukraine, and at the break we're going to play a movie that shows the cesium coming out of the plant. It goes everywhere. It doesn't stop at the borders. And so one of the tenets of this is that when we have an accident like this and radiation leakage all the time through the fuel cycle, it's not just the Ukraine that's involved. It's all of us that are involved. <laughs> Well, I visited hospital number six a month after uh, Chernobyl went up. I was doing a speaking tour in East and West Germany, and the contrast between what people were told in the two countries was quite amazing. And yet, even in Marburg, Germany, a university town much like Madison, Wisconsin, after my talk, the mayor came up to me and said, what should I tell people? Should I tell them to stay indoors? Should we have the cows out? What should we be doing? I get different answers from my nuclear engineers, from my scientists, from my physicians. I don't know what to tell people. He said, the, the, the county next door, the cows are out in the field. We're keeping our cows in. And he said, we found puddles that kids are playing in that are highly radioactive. Because this radiation doesn't just go evenly everywhere. It tends to settle in particular areas. And you can't get it off. And I said, I don't know. And this is the dilemma that the government and TEPCO is facing in Fukushima. And I'm sure he faced in the Ukraine. What do we tell people? We are trying to manage the unmanageable here. This is an engineer who was in the level below the reactor, and he heard the explosion came up into the reactor room, uh, helped put out the fires. He's uh, had beta burns on his legs from the radiation wafting up his pants. Um, and he's bronze from liver failure. His hair is all fallen out, and this gentleman died uh, because his blood cells quit reproducing. And then this was a firefighter uh, who was in an isolation tent who also died. Uh, so these were the acute radiation injuries that occurred. And this is what you hear all the time. Not many people die, just 56. Uh, and yet, we're going to hear about the other effects that go on and on and on from this. Well, this produced Chernobyl. And uh, in this case, the trees were all uh, dead and the land scraped, scraped off. When I was here, this was two years after Chernobyl, and I saw road graders out scraping up dirt. And I said, what, uh, what do you, how do you know about how much radiation these guys are getting? They didn't have any respirators on there. Oh, they're all monitored. And I said, well, where's your monitor? And the guy opened his coat and said, oh, I think I left it at home today. And that's what's happened with lots of the information from the, the people who were working there. Here we are in front of the sarcophagus. We're trying to build a new sarcophagus now. Uh, raise money, which is a good effort, but we're a little short on funds, and Japan has just announced that they're not going to give any because they've got their own problems. And so how do we know economies are going to be able to support this? Well, 
So we're looking at a situation where we really don't know the long-term genetic effects of this. Uh, we look at epigenetics and the new things that are coming along. We know very little about what's happening here. And so as this says, he's grown a foot since I last saw him. Uh, we are seeing aberrations in animals and plants uh, in the area. Natural disasters have a beginning and a middle and an end. But radiation goes on and on and on. It contaminates, it befouls, it penetrates, and the fear lingers on and on. It's truly the forever pollution. And the nuclear industrial complex, we must remember to tie it because nuclear weapons and nuclear power go hand in hand. They are like a hand and a glove. And we see many, many examples of that around the world. And so we need to keep this in mind as we think about both nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants. As Einstein said, the splitting of the atom has changed everything save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. Our prescription is that we have to abolish nuclear weapons, and we have to do that quickly. We have to prevent nuclear war. If we don't like Chernobyl and Fukushima, imagine what the next nuclear weapon going off in a city like Washington or San Francisco or any city around the world is going to be like. It's beyond imagination. There is no cure for this. The only cure is prevention. And we believe that the same applies to nuclear power. There is no way to guarantee that we're not going to have another Fukushima. In fact, as power plants proliferate, the likelihood of that increases. So we think that we have to move in the direction of moving away from this to truly sustainable green energy. Thank you very much.